Greetings, my name is Sean Hartzell. I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator for the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about aquatic invasive species. So in our brief amount of time today, we'll go over uh, what aquatic invasive species are. We're gonna do a brief tour, talk about just a few high profile aquatic invasive species and their impacts in Pennsylvania. We'll talk about some practices anglers and boaters can use to help stop the spread, what you can do to help us uh, control some of these species in Pennsylvania. And finally, a very important piece, we'll talk about how to report any suspected aquatic invasive species you find to us at the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. So aquatic invasive species are considered a subset of alien species. An alien species is defined as any species capable of propagating, that means reproducing and establishing a population uh, that is not native, that's not supposed to be in a particular ecosystem or geographic area. Invasive species are alien species whose introduction does or is likely to cause harm in a number of ways. We're talking either economic, environmental harm, and or harm to human health. And so invasive species are alien species that cause some sort of damage. Finally, aquatic invasive species, what we're focusing on today, are a subset of invasive species. So they're invasive species that live in the water. Aquatic invasive species can be detrimental in three primary ways. The first is economic. They can harm industry. Uh, certain aquatic invasive species like zebra mussels can clog pipes, which cause millions of dollars in damage each year. And they can harm aquatic recreation. We'll certainly talk about examples as we go along. But if you look at that picture of the screen, we have a lake that's choked with an aquatic invasive plant called hydrilla. And this is uh, majorly impacting aquatic recreation in that lake. It'd be very difficult to fish, even maybe with a topwater lure, it'd be really difficult to boat in there as well. They also cause ecological harm. Usually what aquatic invasive species do when they come into an ecosystem, they mess up the food web in some way. And ultimately this can lead to diminished game fish, uh, harm endangered species, and sometimes they can carry diseases as well, which could impact species in addition to those direct ecological impacts. And finally, in some ways, they can hurt human health. In Pennsylvania, we don't have too many concerns about this, but one of our concerns is botulism, uh, which can be carried by one of our aquatic invasive fish, the round goby. So very briefly, one of the many components of the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission's jurisdiction from the Pennsylvania Code is the encouragement, promotion, and development of fishery interests and the protection, propagation, and distribution of fish. Aquatic invasive species can harm both of these, and so that's why we're particularly interested in them as an agency. In addition to that, within the PA Code, law broadly defines fish to include all game fish, fish bait, bait fish, amphibians, reptiles, and aquatic organisms. And aquatic invasive species, depending what they are, fall into one or more of these categories. Lastly, uh, there are some specific aquatic invasive species that are regulated that are actually banned for sale, possession, or transport in Pennsylvania. Uh, we'll talk about a few of those as we go throughout this talk. And we also have special regulations for grass carp and all crayfish species. And we'll talk about the crayfish regulations towards the end of our talk today. So now what I will do is go through a few examples of aquatic invasive species. We'll highlight a few uh, that are of particular concern to us as a Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Uh, the first example are aquatic invasive nuisance weeds. We're going to lump these all together. Uh, we have a few notable examples in Pennsylvania. The worst uh, that we consider as an agency is hydrilla, uh, Eurasian water milfoil, and European water chestnut. We have a few other examples as well that are up on the screen. But what all of these do is they choke waterways and ultimately this impedes angling and boating. In addition to this, they'll also do some ecosystem disruption, but really these have a very evident direct uh, effect on angling and boating. And so you can see in the picture here, uh, I have our aquatic invasive weed hydrilla, a big concern in Pennsylvania. 
on the top picture, we have a boat propeller that is just covered in hydrilla. You're not going to be getting anywhere uh, when it becomes infested in that lake. And even if you're using an unpowered boat, it's going to be really tough to paddle. Also, fishing is going to be impaired by these. So um, again, if you're using a topwater lure, you might have some degree of luck. Anything that goes in the water, you're really not going to have luck at all. It's just going to get snagged by weeds. And even with using top water, sometimes these uh, weed cover becomes so thick uh, that fish are not really going to be able to bite through them. So it's really going to impair angling success all across the board. When these get into a waterway, they can be really expensive, really difficult to get out. Uh, we can treat them with aquatic herbicides, but very often these just grow back again and again and again. And so we really want to try to stop the problem before it starts, prevent them from getting anywhere in the first place. One of our major aquatic invasive fish species of concern in Pennsylvania is the northern snakehead. Northern snakehead are from Asia. They're obligate air breathers, so they will actually swim to the surface of the water column to breathe and they can attain very large sizes. The world record was captured just shy of two years ago in the Potomac River of Virginia. It was 19 and a half pounds. Currently, Pennsylvania does not track any size records for northern snakehead. Northern snakehead are a major concern for fisheries because they can substantially alter fisheries. When snakehead come to town, it affects almost every other fish uh, in that fish community. In particular, they're a major concern for many of our predatory sport fish, particularly largemouth and smallmouth bass. Northern snakehead are fierce competitors with bass, and when snakehead establish the bass populations, the bass fishery will diminish substantially. In addition to that, they also majorly alter panfish communities. They're voracious predators, and so they can impact panfish uh, fisheries as well. In addition to these direct ecological effects that they have on the fishery, they also bring diseases with them. Northern snakehead carry largemouth bass virus. It appears that snakehead themselves are not really affected by the virus, they're just carriers, uh, but that can have substantial impacts on our largemouth bass populations. Snakeheads are currently banned for live possession and transport under the 58 PA code chapter 71 and 73 regulations. So they may not be possessed live, however, we certainly encourage you, if you are fishing uh, and you catch one, please kill the fish. Please do not release the fish. Please take it home. Uh, my biologist tip for the day, first and foremost, is snakehead are really good eating. I haven't had snakehead myself. I've heard it tastes very similar to cod. Uh, and we want you, if you catch any while you're out, report it to us. Make sure to catch it. Uh, take it home with you, uh, kill that fish so it doesn't impact our fishery. Uh, you can, we can all do our part. Snakehead are uh, shallow water fish. They prefer warm, weedy areas. So we're talking backwaters, the shallows of ponds, things like that. And so it's highly recommended to use weedless lures in order to catch these fish. That seems to be what they attract to the most. Unfortunately, with the snakehead, we can have a case of mistaken identity. We have two native Pennsylvania fish, the bowfin and the state endangered burbot, uh, which both look similar in appearance to the northern snakehead. The northern snakehead does not possess any barbels or whiskers on its mouth, whereas our burbot, uh, which is there on the left, has whiskers kind of similar to like a catfish. Um, so if you catch something, you're not sure whether it's a snakehead or a burbot, look for the whiskers. If there's whiskers there, you probably have a burbot. The bowfin on the right differs from the snakehead in the uh, uh, size of the anal fin. Uh, so if you look at the northern snakehead, that anal fin on the bottom is very elongated. It goes from about the middle of the snake's belly all the way down to the tail. The bowfin uh, has a very small anal fin uh, that's distributed in two different parts. So those are easy, easy ID characteristics to tell the difference between these two. Next up is our round goby. Uh, these are native to the Caspian Sea, the Mediterranean region of the world. They were probably transported to the Great Lakes region in the ballast water of ships. These are small fish. Uh, they attain a maximum length of about 10 inches. Usually they're a fair bit smaller than this. Round gobies disrupt food webs, just like our other aquatic invasive species do, and they'll compete with some of our small native fish, such as darters and sculpin. In addition to that, they'll consume baby mussels, the microscopic larva uh, of mussels, which is of major concern, especially because we have a number of threatened and endangered mussel species in Pennsylvania. And just like the northern snakehead, the round goby cannot be possessed live in Pennsylvania or transported. It's also included uh, in our PA code chapter 71 and 73 regulations. 
Now, I'm sure many of you are thinking that goby looks an awful lot like a native sculpin, and they certainly do. However, there's a really easy tell to distinguish the two. If we look on the left, the round goby has fused pelvic fins that make sort of a suction cup-like shape. So if you have the fish in hand, flip it over, uh, look at the belly, look at those pelvic fins. If they're fused and look like a suction cup, it's a round goby. The sculpin, on the other hand, on the right, does not have fused pelvic fins. They'll just have two small, distinct pelvic fins. Uh, so that's a really easy way to tell the difference pretty quickly between our gobies and our sculpins. So one of our invertebrate species of concern is an aquatic invasive species in Pennsylvania is the rusty crayfish. These are native to parts of the Midwestern US, but were probably introduced into Pennsylvania via the bait trade a number of decades ago. Rusty crayfish can achieve very high densities. There are some spots invaded with rusty crayfish. Everywhere you step in the water, you hear a crunch and you're stepping on a rusty crayfish. Uh, they displace native crayfish. Native crayfish disappear when rusty crayfish establish in a waterway and they harm plants and invertebrates by consuming them um, and so majorly disrupt ecosystems. Rusty crayfish are also less palatable to native predators. They have very large claws, so they're able to more easily get away from fish predators than our native crayfish. And so they diminish the food available to some of our sport fish, such as largemouth and smallmouth bass. And rusty crayfish are regulated under the PA code chapter 71 and 73 concerning all crayfish. We'll talk a little bit more about those regulations a little later. Other aquatic invasive species of major concern in PA are zebra and quagga mussels. These are native to the Caspian Sea, just like the round goby, probably came uh, to the Great Lakes from the ballast water of trade ships, and they're very capable of hitchhiking on boats. They can either attach themselves as adults to boats, especially the boats are moored in the water uh, for a period of time, um, or uh, more likely, they can transport in the ballast water or live well water of boats, particularly when they're microscopic in their juvenile or larval stage. Zebra and quagga mussels are a major food web disruptor. Uh, they mess with food webs, ultimately impacting the whole ecosystem. They'll clog intake pipes, as I mentioned, cause a lot of e uh, economic damage. And they also compete with native mussel species. Again, we have a number of uh, threatened and endangered mussels in PA, uh, so these are just another problem to conserving our mussels. And just like a few of the other species I'm mentioning today, these are also banned for live possession and transport under our PA code regulations. So our last aquatic invasive species we'll talk about is the New Zealand mud snail. New Zealand mud snail are very tiny. You can see on the picture with a dime, there's about 100 mud snails, so very, very minute. Uh, and these are relatively new invaders in PA. Uh, they're known from Lake Erie and from Spring Creek in central Pennsylvania. We've had a number of new records in recent years pop up in southeastern Pennsylvania. Mud snails compete with native macroinvertebrates. They chain very high densities, just like rusty crayfish do. And ultimately, this impacts food webs. The science has shown that especially in trout fisheries, New Zealand mud snail are a major concern uh, because they diminish the good food that's available to trout. Trout will lose weight, and this diminishes the trout fishery. New Zealand mud snail are also very capable of hitchhiking on waders, very good hitchhikers. They're very teeny tiny. They can survive outside of water for up to a few days, and they reproduce asexually. This means that we don't need two snails to get together to reproduce. Only one snail can start a new population. So we have talked about some aquatic invasive species of major concern. Now we're going to talk briefly about what you can do to help stop the spread of aquatic invasive species in Pennsylvania. And first, looking at the signage on the left, you've probably seen this at places that you like to go and boat. Uh, but there's some general guidelines that are super, super important uh, to stop the spread of aquatic invasive species and very easy to do. So we really encourage you, we all need to do our part uh, in order to protect our fisheries. When you're boating, when you pull your boat out of the water, uh, make sure before you drive off that you remove any mud that's on the boat. This could have closed the larval stages of aquatic invasive species. Also make sure to remove plants. Uh, very often something like hydrilla, even if uh, there's just a little scrap, a little leaf of that plant, if it gets into another water, it can grow from that and form a new population. So check for mud, check for plants, make sure to remove all of that from your boat before leaving. Make sure to drain 
all of the water. We talked about how aquatic invasive species, especially the larval stages, uh, can hang out in water on boats. So make sure to drain your live well, drain your bilge, and drain your bait bucket. In addition to that, too, even the, uh, besides the larval stages of aquatic invasive species, we can also have uh, certain viruses, I'll talk about that later, other pathogens uh, that you can spread as well, which are considered invasive species. So we could be spreading fish diseases as well, which we certainly don't want. Then make sure that you clean your boat with hot water or let everything dry for five days. Even if you check everything, even if you drain everything, uh, there could still be some residual critters hanging out that you did not see. And so we really encourage, if you're going to a new uh, water within the next five days, make sure that you clean your boat very well with hot water. Uh, go to a car wash, use a pressure washer, or something like that, or dry everything. Let that boat sit out in the hot sun for five days, making sure all that water dries up. So that way any critters that may be hitchhiking uh, will desiccate and die. If you're just fishing, uh, make sure that you check your gear. So we have over here on the left-hand side some general guidance. You've probably seen this before uh, posted at places you like to fish uh, about stopping aquatic invasive hitchhikers uh, from your angling gear. Just like your boat, check all your gear, check your waders, remove any mud, any bits of plants, anything like that before leaving. And very important, dispose of any unwanted bait in the trash. Don't just dump any bait, especially live bait, into the water. Uh, make sure that that's thrown away in a trash can. Uh, bait bucket introductions are a major source of aquatic invasive species and a major source of transporting diseases between waterways. So we really don't want that to happen. Make sure again, just like your boat, if there's any water in your equipment, have water in a bucket, something like that, make sure you drain everything before transporting things elsewhere. And just like your boat, make sure to clean your gear when you get home with hot water or let it sit out and dry for five days, just like your boat. Lastly, never release any plants, fish, or animals into a body of water unless they came out of that body of water. So if we're collecting bait somewhere, we're using it elsewhere, do not release any of that bait into that water. Don't do any transports. If you're thinking, okay, I'll bring some fish from point A to point B, maybe stock or something like that, uh, that can actually bring pathogens, diseases, or introduce invasive species, and it can really harm the fishery rather than supporting the fishery. So we just want to really emphasize uh, making sure to drain your live wells, making sure to drain your bait buckets. Don't transport fish or bait and release them between waters. We mentioned that in the previous slide, but this is really key, really important to preserving our fisheries. This can spread, in addition to aquatic invasive species, pathogens like largemouth bass virus. We have a largemouth bass in the picture on the left infected with this virus that causes sores, causes all sorts of issues, can really diminish our fisheries. So don't transport any fish, bait, or live well water between water bodies. That's a major concern. And with our crayfish, our special regulations state that any crayfish you take for bait, uh, you'll have to immediately remove the head above the eyes uh, for the crayfish, unless you're fishing specifically uh, in the waters from which it was taken. So if you go to your favorite lake, catch a few crayfish from the lake, it's totally fine uh, to fish with the crayfish there without removing the head. If you go somewhere, collect some crayfish, maybe you're minnow trapping or something, want to take the crayfish elsewhere, you need to remove their head. Uh, crayfish can become invasive species very easily. Uh, they can escape hooks, all that kind of thing. So this is a regulation that we're really strict about here. Also, please don't use goldfish, comets, koi, and common carp as bait. This is unlawful in Pennsylvania. And the bottom line or key message here is a short-term convenience for some. Right, Doing any of these things, not worrying about cleaning your gear, transporting uh, fish between waters, not cleaning or draining live wells, even though you're saving a couple minutes, uh, you could ruin a fishery for all by spreading these around. So we really, really don't want that. So our very last point for the day, if you see anything you suspect is an aquatic invasive species, uh, you can submit that to us. This is really important data for us to use in management and keeping track on where aquatic invasive species are. So submit that to our report aquatic invasive species web portal. I have the web link here. If you just type in aquatic invasive species Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, we have a great informational web page that'll pop up and this will be a link on that. Uh, provide as much detailed information as you can for us. There's all these fields that you can populate. And really important, if you have the opportunity, please take some photos. That's really helpful to our biologists for identification. 
So that's everything from my end. I really appreciate your time and attention. Uh, please make sure to take these this guidance to heart. Um, I hope that you follow these best management practices that we've talked about today. If you have any questions, please submit them uh, in written form to the panel as instructed previously. And again, I'd really like to thank you for your time and your interest with this presentation.